Tuesday, August 12, 2014, high noon, and I am so pleased to have Jonathan Blockmacher and Brandon Santula here with me for what is going to be a fantastic 40-minute presentation on foreign and domestic asset protection trusts, tax uses of those trusts, and power of appointment planning. So Jonathan and Brandon, welcome. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Alan. I'm going to give you just a couple of preliminary slides here. On September 3rd, my partner Ken Crotty is going to provide a 50-minute free presentation on disaster avoidance on Highway 709. That's gift tax return issues. Also, on September 9th, I'm going to talk on the ABCs of reverse mortgages. I'm rehearsing for part of my Notre Dame presentation this year. And I need some guinea pigs, so I hope you'll join us for a 20-minute webinar to find out how reverse mortgages work and why your clients probably don't want to have anything to do with them. Also, on September 29th, my friend Leslie Scher from Miami is going to be talking about demystifying the U.S. tax and estate planning considerations for foreign investors. This is actually based upon a one-half-hour telephone conference that Les and I had with a client a couple of months ago, he explained things so well that not only did I understand them, but the client understood them, so I asked him to come back and, and do that. So these are all free webinars. Now, getting started here, I cannot say enough good things about Jonathan Blockmacher. In fact, I am pinching myself that I'm here right now live with him on this webinar. Jonathan is clearly the most influential tax lawyer and advisor in the estate planning community and in the history of the estate planning community. And if you haven't heard him speak or read his materials, then you're in for a real treat today. Also, Brandon Centula is a very, very bright and articulate trust officer with Alaska Trust Company. He has a great and very detailed understanding of what it takes to put together a proper trust. He's very familiar with complex tax issues, and he has a really good hands-on approach to serving as a trust officer and, and to help you make sure that your trusts are properly drafted. So once again, we welcome you. I also wanted to mention Jonathan is going to be speaking at the Southern Federal Tax Institute Thursday, October 23rd on the future of estate planning. That might be a good reason to go to that institute. He is speaking at the Notre Dame Institute. This is the 40th annual institute this year, Friday, November 14, on the IRS's recent attacks on private annuity skins and installment sales. He's speaking at Heckerling, January 15th, on split interest trusts created by entities. Sometimes a good notion. You don't want to miss those. In addition, April 24th, he's speaking at, for my alma mater, University of Florida College of Law Annual Tax Institute, examining and restructuring pre-ATRA estate planning strategies. That's going to be fascinating. His article in the August 2014 edition of Estate Planning Magazine should also not be missed. Searching for basis in estate planning, less tax for heirs. This is one productive guy. And finally, before we forget, I want to mention that his article in the winter 2013 Real Property Trust and Estate Law Journal of the American Bar Association is really the best thing that I've ever seen written on everything you need to know about powers of appointment. So Jonathan, do you want to take it from here and tell us what we're going to talk about today? Well, Alan, thank you very much, and thank you for your kind words, and welcome, everyone. It's a delight for me to be here and talk about two topics which have always been of great interest to me and I use constantly. One is using trusts to provide protection for a family's wealth, critically important. In fact, I've actually had clients who've come in and said, well, I want this property paid out to my kids at 30 or 35 or 40, or I want it to go outright and I always refuse to represent them because I explain that what you're doing is you're now offering up their wealth that they get from you by gifts or inheritances to be subject to claims of creditors, including for over half of your children the claim that will arise in the divorce, keeping in mind that over half of first marriages in the United States end in divorce 
and the person whom you shared your most intimate and important moments with is going to become your largest financial predator of your lifetime. The only way to protect it is to put it in trust. And I've actually said to people, I will not represent you unless you agree to put virtually all property in trust. And we're going to talk about that. The other thing we're going to talk about is that power of appointment concept, one of the most powerful tools in estate planning. And I'm confident that I've saved my clients hundreds of millions of dollars and also protected hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars from creditor claim to the effective use of powers of appointment. Let's begin by talking about how does liability arise and how can you lose your assets? And Alan, I'm going to rely on you to bring these things down. Uh, you've got to have a loss. Somebody has to suffer some sort of loss for which they feel compensated. And uh, Alan, let, you can just continue to go down and I'll catch up. Now, there's, what's the motivation to make a claim? It can be manyfold. Typically, it's to get money. Sometimes it's just to get even. And one of the things is, if you are sued, you may lose even if you successfully defend. Because it's easier to begin a frivolous lawsuit against someone than to defend it. And I've seen circumstances where the lawsuit was absolutely ridiculous, but if you default, there will be a judgment and you will lose property. That's a real problem. Alan, let's go down again, if we could, to the types of claims. One is a contract claim, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but everybody who's on the phone knows that you do not need a written agreement to have a contract. You can be oral. It can even arise through a course of conduct. And all of a sudden, someone has come and said, we had a course of conduct. You failed to carry out your side of the contract, and I'm going to sue you till you're blue. Tort liability is so broad, I can't even list them all. Breach of duty. Uh, in, intentional infliction of emotional distress. So if Alan plays a joke on me, if I'm emotionally distressed by that, I may be able to sue him for big damages. Statutory liability can arise in many ways. The Superfund laws in the United States are so great that there is no statute of limitations. There is no ability to protect yourself through an entity like a corporation. So if you have a corporation, and the corporation buys a piece of land, and you've inspected that property, and you are the greenest person in the world, but we later discover that some farmer 100 years ago buried pesticides on that property, and it is now leaking into the water supply, and people are becoming sick, the federal government can come in without with piercing the corporate veil and make you liable, even though you didn't know it, even though you were against it. Now, you may have claims over against other, but the Superfund law is there, and it's a statutory liability. Sexual harassment is a statutory liability. The antitrust laws are a big statutory liability. And the one we all love so much are taxes. That all arises because of statutes. In addition, you have family obligations, and those will either arise under statute or under the common law. For example, you have a duty to support your spouse, you have a duty to support at least your minor children, and in some jurisdictions you may even have an obligation to support your parents. Why are those laws in, the, in place? Because the state doesn't want to have to pay for them. It wants you to pay for them. And one of the things to really counsel your clients about is to try to convince them that their children should have prenuptial agreements. Just like strong fences make good neighbors, well, a good prenup, in some cases, can prevent a marriage from breaking down. Or if it does break down, and again, in over 50% of the cases it will, you can limit the amount of damage in most cases if you have a carefully prepared prenuptial agreement. By the way, one of my things I did for my clients that they love is when we would create a trust, we would put in a provision to say that this particular descendant, my granddaughter, Alan's son, whoever it is, is only eligible to receive distributions from this trust if married, if that descendant has entered into a prenuptial or a postnuptial agreement satisfactory to the independent trustees to protect the interests of that descendant. This means that when my granddaughter goes to get married and she goes to her fiance and says, you know, my grandfather created these trusts for me, 
this is going to be great for us, except I have to have a prenup or I'm just not eligible to receive anything. I can tell you every time that has arisen, the fiancé is more than happy to sign up. So that's something that you can put in your trust and your clients will just love it. Alan, let's go to our next slide. How are claims enforced? I'm not going to go through with this in detail, but usually you have to have a judgment in a court, but not always. For example, the IRS has super vapen powers to grab your property if you owe it money, and often without anything to do with a court. You can go into bankruptcy and try to get certain claims discharged, but as we know from that innocent man, O.J. Simpson, if it's an intentional tort, of which, of course, he was improperly found guilty of civilly, although, thank goodness, not criminally, there is no discharge. In addition, there is virtually no discharge when you owe money to the Internal Revenue Service. In addition, if you've made a fraudulent transfer, that money for a long, long time is going to be subject to grabs. Alan, let's go to our next screen, please. Liability for business claims, you don't want to do that. If you have a client who's a general partner in a partnership, he or she has to understand that they are liable for all the claims against that company, even if your client had nothing to do with it, even if your client tried to adopt the most safe procedures, he or she is personally liable if they're a general partner. In addition, of course, if they operate something directly, they're the direct owner of a piece of real estate where someone is injured, they can be personally liable. Indeed, in all states, including Florida and New York, you even owe a duty to a trespasser in some cases. So if you have something on your property which is dangerous, someone comes on that property and they're injured, even if they're a trespasser, they may be able to sue you not just for the value of the property, but everything you own. And one of the areas in which I did tremendous work for clients, and I love when someone who was in the real estate business would come in, because I'd always find some piece of property or many pieces of property for which they were going to be personally liable or where there was cross liability because they had, for example, one LLC owning multiple pieces of property. And if it was damaged, that was caused by one of those pieces of property, it would extend to losing all of those pieces of property. This is something where I assure you, you can expand your practice if you learn this area well and you talk to your clients who are in business where they own real estate or other uh, property they operate. Alan, let's go to the next one if we could. Now, which assets are liable? As a general rule, everything you own is liable for it. There are, under the bankruptcy law, two choices. You can either take state exemptions, and for example, if you have inherited an IRA recently, in some states, such as Texas and Alaska, Alan, I don't know if this is so in Florida, but in those states, even inherited IRAs are protected as a matter of state law. But the recent Clark case by the Supreme Court said there's no protection under federal law. And even though the uh, person in that case who was the bankrupt had elected for the state exemptions, the state didn't provide an exemption for inherited IRAs. There are only seven states that do right now. There are some interests which are protected, but again, that depends upon federal or state law. Some states, like like Florida is perhaps the best for this, and Texas is the best for this, your homestead is completely protected from claims of creditors. And that's a very, very important thing to keep in mind. Let's go, Alan, to our next slide, if we could, please. How do we protect it? Well, one thing is to get a lot of insurance. And insurance can be a good thing, because maybe the insurance company has to pay, but of course you've got to pay for the insurance coverage. But sometimes the claim will exceed the amount of insurance coverage, or the insurance company will claim that the particular claim made is not going to be covered by the insurance. One of the things that your clients can do is to avoid making guarantees. And I have some clients who absolutely will not make guarantees. When they go to the bank and they want to borrow money, they'll pay a little bit more on the interest charge, but they will not go ahead and make personal guarantees. Bad things happen to good people. John Connolly, the former governor of Texas, who was with John Kennedy when he was assassinated and Governor Connolly was shot himself, was one of the richest men in the state of Texas. 
In the early 1960s, his wealth exceeded $100 million, which at the time was enormous. Unfortunately, he made personal guarantees on certain real estate investments in Texas, and he went through personal bankruptcy. And from being one of the richest men in the country, he wound up essentially with nothing. Please have your clients avoid guarantees. One of the other things you could do is to have separate entities for every separate business and each separate business function. For my father-in-law, who was in the ready-mix cement business, for example, we had every truck owned by a separate entity. We had every plant owned by a separate entity. We had a different entity that dealt with the public and a different entity which actually delivered the goods. The reason we did that, he was once sued, and he could have lost everything in his life. But having separate entities, and I structured it so they were owned slightly differently. He might own 98% of one, and his wife might own 2% of another. Another he might own 80%, and his five children might own the other 20%. You can be extremely clever here and extremely effective keeping in mind that the United States is the most litigious society in the entire world. This will make you very proud. The United States has 3% of the world's population, and we have 60% of the world's lawyers. And I think that says it all. Alan, let's go to our next slide, if we could, please. How to protect yourself. Well, again, limited liability entities, prenuptial agreements, acquire exempt assets. <clears throat> you may be, for example, in Florida, Texas, Kansas, where there's an exemption for the homestead essentially without limitation. Other states, including New York and California, the amount of exemption for a homestead is very, very, very small. So suppose I'm sued here in New York and I say, well, you know, I've always thought about going to Florida. Maybe what I'll do is I'll sell my house here. It's going to take years before they get a bankruptcy judgment against me, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move to Florida and buy a big home. Well, the bankruptcy law, Section 548, provides that you only get the exemption if you've essentially owned the home for four years. At one time, it was possible to buy it when you were anticipating, probably you can't. In almost all states, the cash value component of life insurance is protected from claims of creditors, even in bankruptcy, if you take the state exemptions. So in New York and Florida and Texas and most states, although not California, California being the worst state to be a debtor in my judgment, the cash value you have in life insurance is immunized. So if I go through bankruptcy and I get a discharge, and again, remember for some things, like poor OJ couldn't get a discharge because they found his tort was intentional, I can go through bankruptcy, get a discharge, and then go to the Metropolitan or Jan, John Hancock or Prudential and say, hey, the $5 million in the cash value account, give it to me and that will be completely protected from the claims of my creditor. In many states, including Florida, the cash value in an annuity contract is also exempt. But the number of states that provide complete protection for the cash value component of an annuity contract is much smaller than it is for life insurance. Qualified plans, like you're an employee at a corporation, your qualified plan or your 401k plan is immunized under federal law but there is an exception. And that's where the debtor is the only participant in the plan. So if you're a physician and you figured out a way not to have any employees because you don't want to have to provide pension benefits to them, yes, you can do that in some cases by hiring independent contractors, but it means if you're the sole participant in that plan, no asset protection for you. IRAs. This is a state law determination except for where you've taken a qualified plan and rolled it into an IRA, then you get protection under federal law. Keep in mind that recent Clark case by the Supreme Court, if your mommy or daddy dies and you are the successor to the IRA and you're now dribbling out the distributions, taking the smallest minimum required distributions permitted and you go through bankruptcy, it is subject to attachment unless your state provides protection. What you should consider, even if the state does provide protection, is to have it go into a trust. So if your daddy creates a trust and makes the pension benefits payable to the IRA benefits payable to the trust, then you're going to get the protection under the spendthrift laws of your state if you do it right. 
trust others have created for you. You will really get maximum protection. If you're like Alan and you're going to inherit a tremendous amount of money when your parents die, make sure you get it in trust and not outright. If you get it outright, it is subject to claims of creditors, including your spouse in the event of a divorce, unless you have an effective prenuptial agreement or you're in a state like a community property state where the inheritance is not subject to division upon divorce. But keep in mind, it's up to the person who claims the exemption who has to prove that special pedigree. And if you're like me, things will get mixed up in your marriage. <clears throat> For example, my mother had given me a piece of property in the town of Southampton on Long Island. That's my sole and separate property. My wife, Betsy, isn't entitled to any of it. But what did I do? I began to improve the property. And if Betsy and I got divorced, I know she, her lawyer is going to say, Jonathan, part of that is now subject to equitable division by the court. <clears throat> and that can happen <clears throat> in community property jurisdictions as well. There is a super creditor out there called the federal government. And the federal government has its own super vapen powers. And there are cases, and we're going to get to one soon, called the Dry Case. In fact, Alan, let's go to the next page if we could. In the Dry Case, the Supreme Court said, as far as the federal government's ability, and this is not just the IRS, it applies to other claims of the federal government, the ability of the federal government to grab an interest of a beneficiary in a trust, even though it's a spencer of trust under state law, someone else created for this person who owes money to the, to the IRS or other federal agency. Even though it's not technically a property right as defined under state law, the federal government no doubt can attach it. This is a very, very frightening thing that you say, wait, wait a minute. We said this is a spendthrift trust. It's a spendthrift trust under the law of East Virginia or wherever that person lives, wherever the trust was created. But these federal statutes can override that. In fact, last year with some of my Alaska colleagues, we passed a special law trying to cut it off. It is a very, very broad new law. Brandon worked on it with me, as others did. And I can tell you, if you want maximum protection, and I know there are going to be other states that follow, I would take a look at having the trust created in Alaska. I'm talking about a trust that someone creates for someone else. This is one you create for your kids, or your mom, or your dad, or even for your spouse, if you want it fully protected, even from the special powers of attachment which the federal government has granted itself and granted no one else. Let's go to our next slide, if we could, Alan. And this relates to, again, trust you create for yourself. Well, <clears throat> under English law, and you'll see down there the statute of Elizabeth, England passed a law to prevent people from putting property in trust for themselves and protecting it from the claims of their creditors. That statute of Elizabeth essentially was adopted either by statute or by common law in the United States. And uh, basically, the law said, if you create a trust of which you are a beneficiary, either entitled to the property, like entitled to the income, or merely eligible to receive it in the discretion of a trustee, it is forever subject to the claims of your creditors, even if you weren't trying to defraud anyone. So if in 1970, I created a trust for my wife and my mother and dad and my kids and my favorite charity with an independent fiduciary like, say now, the Alaska Trust Company with no understandings, no winks, and I never get a distribution. They give money to my wife, to my kids, to my mother, maybe to my favorite charity. I never get anything. And I have an accident today more than, you know, 50 years later and someone gets a judgment from me, under the law of most states, they merely have to go to the trustee and say, pay up. And because under the law of most states, a trust you create or settle for yourself, a so-called self-settled trust, is void with respect to the settlers or grantors creditors. In the 1980s, some foreign jurisdictions, some of which you cannot find on a map, like Vanuatu or Mauritius, began to pass laws which said, if an American comes here and creates a trust for her own benefit, it will be immunized from the claims of her creditors. 
By the way, interestingly, those laws they passed for Americans didn't apply to people who lived there, but nonetheless they were there. And a tremendous amount of money began to pour out of the United States into these self-settled trusts in these places all around the world. Most of them were islands like uh, the Isle of Jersey, uh, Isle of Guernsey, the Isle of Man, Mauritius. There was even one in the Bahamas. There was one in Bermuda, although I believe Bermuda has since repealed it. Uh, there was concern by the federal government <clears throat> that, that some of this was used for money laundering, and they put a lot of pressure on some of these jurisdictions to get rid of their self-settled asset protection laws. Let's go to our next slide, Alan, and explore that a little bit more. <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> there's a provision in the United States Bankruptcy Law, Section 548E, which says, if you create a self-settled trust, presumably meaning in the United States or outside of the United States, and you are intending to hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor, then for 10 years those assets are subject to the claims of creditors that arise in a bankruptcy proceeding. And one of the problems is that it will be difficult to convince in a United States court that when you created that trust in Mauritius or Vanuatu or the Cook Islands, that you were not trying to hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor. I mean, there are lots of reasons, some of which we'll get to, about why you might want to create a self-settled trust here in the United States for non-real defrauding creditor reasons. But if you go offshore, it's going to be extremely difficult to convince the court that you had some other reason to do it. Some of the reasons I've heard is, well, I avoid the SEC reporting rules. Well, uh, that's probably not going to convince the court. Well, I know when I die the money that's earned in that, the income that's earned, is not going to be subject to American taxation. That may be true, but if it generally it's a horror show for an American to have a foreign trust. So to begin with, you may have a problem there. The good news is, even if the bankruptcy court says we're not going to give a discharge, uh, it's impossible for an American court to directly have the U.S. judgment enforced in these foreign jurisdictions. They put up such tremendous obstacles that it becomes almost impossible to have an American judgment enforced in a foreign land. In fact, in some places, like in the Cook Islands, they will never respect a foreign judgment. You have to retry the case. It's very difficult to find a lawyer. There's an exceptionally short statute of limitations. And to prove it was a fraudulent transfer in the proceeding in the Cook Islands, you have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Really tough. Bad news is you will pay more to have it set up. The lawyers who do these foreign asset protection trusts charge more, and one of the reasons is they feel that there may be vicarious liability to them. Also, you're going to lose control, and you run a risk of confiscation. I had a client who took his money to Vanuatu. There was a coup of the government there, and he lost every bit of his money. So that's one of the things to worry about. If your client's going to do it, I would go to a highly civilized jurisdiction, not Vanuatu, maybe not Mauritius, maybe go to the Isle of Guernsey or Journey who are, Jersey who are closely affiliated with Britain, or maybe go to Liechtenstein or someplace like that. You also are not going to get a discharge in bankruptcy, but there was a case called Matter of Portnoy, which was decided by the United States Bankruptcy Court in the, law, in the late 90s, where he created a trust in Jersey or Guernsey. He could not get a discharge, but I understand from the lawyer who represented him that he made a separate deal with the judgment creditor, and he got off at a very, very low price. The real ugly part of foreign trusts is that U.S. courts are more often now prone to put the person who created the trust in jail for contempt. Uh, or finding them perhaps guilty of the crime of bankruptcy fraud. Bankruptcy fraud is a go-to-jail crime, and the courts are now looking at that. And I have never done a foreign asset protection trust. I'm just not brave enough to do it for my clients. And as the outline here indicates, I worry about vicarious liability. I won't go into the details of it, but I was once hired by one of my former partners who was representing a, a woman whose husband put almost all their property in a trust in the Bahamas with the assistance of a major American law firm. 
We couldn't get the money that in that Bahamian Trust, but we threatened the law firm that we were going to sue them on a vicarious liability for aiding in a fraudulent conveyance that he did with respect to his wife. And the husband came in and settled the case within 48 hours. I just do not want it done. In addition, the ethical rules suggest that if you know that your client, and perhaps if you should know that your client is trying to make to defraud somebody by creating a foreign trust, uh, you can be disbarred for that action. There's a recent case in Iowa. I won't go into details, but the lawyer was very, very fortunate to get off. The bar had actually basically found him guilty. The Iowa Supreme Court said no, he really didn't know. There weren't sufficient lights going off and on to give him all the information he'd need. One of the other things that can happen is if you transfer appreciated assets to a foreign trust, there can be gain. If you're a beneficiary of the trust, it will be a so-called grantor trust for income tax purposes, and then that triggering event for the gain doesn't happen, but it can happen at death. This is a complicated area, but if you're dealing with a foreign trust, you either need to study things like Section 684 very thoroughly, or you need to affiliate with someone who's done it before. Uh, there's also questions about estate tax and, and what that will mean. Alan, let's go, if we could, to our next slide, which is going to be U.S. self-settled trusts. Now, there is not as much real-world protection, because if you have a U.S a self-settled trust, whether it's in Alaska or Delaware or Wyoming or Nevada, wherever it is, the trust and all of its assets are subject to the jurisdiction of the United States Bankruptcy Court. But it's also very unlikely you're going to be charged with a bankruptcy crime because if it was a fraudulent transfer, those assets are available to the U.S. court and it can order where they go. Uh, you also reduce the risk of vicarious liability. Alaska was the first state to permit self-settled trust. That was on April 1, 1997. And Brandon, wasn't that a big day in your life? That was a very big day. <laughs> yeah, it was. And Alaska, by the way, has a unique fraudulent transfer rule. It's the only state that hasn't adopted the modern version of the fraudulent conveyance law, uh, which is a much more debtor-friendly law than the original fraudulent transfer rule that Alaska has contended. Now, a lot of people will say, well, it won't work. You can't have a New Yorker go to Alaska, Wyoming, and Nevada and create a self-settled trust because under the full faith and credit clause of the United States Constitution, uh, if I get a judgment uh, against uh, uh, Allen in Florida and Allen is created in Alaska or a Wyoming trust, I can just go to the courts in that state and get the money. You can't. The leading case is Hansen v. Denkla, which is a 1958 Supreme Court case, which says if you get a judgment against the beneficiary of the trust, it can't be enforced against the trust that he or she created for the hair benefit in another jurisdiction. Very important case. Now, a real key, and the reason I decided to seek having a U.S state adopt self-settled trust legislation wasn't so I could assist people in defrauding creditors. It was for estate planning. The tax law has made it very clear that the completion of a gift and inclusion in an estate for a self-settled trust follows governing state law. One of the key rulings is Revenue Ruling 76-103. That ruling states that if you create a trust where your creditors, where the settler's creditors can attach the assets in the trust, even though it's irrevocable, you've retained no power, the gift to the trust is incomplete, and that will also mean it's in your estate. So if today I created a trust in New York, and under Estates, Powers, and Trust Law Section 7-3.1, that trust is going to be permanently subject to the claims of my creditors. I can relegate my creditors to the assets of the trust any time. And that gives me sufficient control over the assets in the trust that the IRS has said it's incomplete. But if I move the trust from New York, say, to Alaska, where it's no longer subject to the claims of my creditors, then it's going to be a completed gift. And it should mean it's excludable from the estate. Uh, we had a difficult time getting it, 
But Brandon, uh, tell us what Private Letter Ruling 2009-44002 said. Well, Jonathan, thank you. Um, 2009-44002 essentially says that a grantor can create a self-settled trust and uh, he can continue, he or she can continue to be a discretionary eligible beneficiary, but the assets will not be includable in their estate or subject to creditor claims. Well, yes, and that, that's true. Uh, other states have tried to get them, and I don't have time to go into it, but I believe the only states where this would work is Alaska and Nevada. Uh, now, uh, let's go on to our next, if we could, Alan, our next screen, because I want to tell you, oh, no, keep going, Alan, I'm going to tell you until you come to Huber. These are all authorities that are great. Now, Huber is a 2013 bankruptcy case decided in the Western District of Washington State. Remember, all bankruptcy courts are federal courts, but just like we have our federal district courts, they're located in different jurisdictions. It's a very bad case. Bad facts make bad law. This man in the state of Washington created a self-settled Alaska trust, and the court struck it down. And in fact, Alaska law doesn't protect trust where it was a fraudulent conveyance, and the court found that. But basically, the court struck it down on every ground possible. Had Washington law apply, uh, it was a very, very bad decision. So, Alan, if you will go a another slide or two. Keep going one more time. Yes, keep going, keep going. All right, stop if you would, Alan. Uh, go back. Uh, here's what you really need to do. If your client wants to create a self-settled trust, you're going to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to have you create a self-settled trust. A self-settled trust, and this is key, is a trust in which the settlor is eligible to receive a distribution in the discretion of a trustee. Take a look at comment F to section 60 of the restatement, third of trust. If creditors of the settlor may attach the maximum interest the settlor retained in the trust, or the trustee could transfer to the settlor. So you're not going to allow the trustee to make any distributions to the settlor. Rather, you're going to grant someone in whom the settlor has great confidence and give them a special power of appointment for example, to make any distributions to the mother of the settlor. So, for example, I want to do a self-settled trust. I'm going to have it for my wife, my kids, my cat, my, and my friends and my charity. I'm not going to be a beneficiary, but I'm going to allow my best friend, Mitchell Gans, Brandon Santula, uh, Alan Gassman, to have a special power of appointment, which that power holder can exercise in the discretion of any descendant of my mother. Now, who is a descendant of my mother? Why, I am. So rather than going to the trustee and say, will you please give me money? Will you be, please buy something for my use? I'm going to go to the power holder, the person who holds this power of appointment in a non-fiduciary capacity. And that prevents it from being a self-settled trust because it's not the trustee who can make a transfer to me, it's merely the exercise of a power of appointment held in a non-fiduciary capacity. And Alan, I know you, and Brandon, I know you've seen dozens and hundreds of cases where people have granted someone a presently exercisable power of appointment. And even if that power could be exercised back in favor of the settlor, it does not make it a self-settled trust and the court can't order the power holder who holds it in a non-fiduciary power a capacity to exercise it in favor of the settlor. That is the best thing you can do. Now, the other thing, if we go to the next page, is there are, there's a, a, a other things that you can do. You ought to have a trustee only in the jurisdiction which provides maximum protection. If you're going to go to Alaska, only have an Alaska trustee. If you're going to go to Nevada, only have a Nevada trustee. Have all the assets situated there. Have a local attorney participate in the trust preparation. These are all mistakes that were made by the people who did the Ubert stuff. How about having the trustees in that jurisdiction? Well, what I would do is I would have separate Alaska trusts for each of my wife and descendants and make those trusts the beneficiary of the trust, the big trust I create there. But the key, the bottom point is allow distributions to the settlor only by a non-fiduciary. 
a lifetime special power of appointment. Now, uh, uh, Brandon, let me ask you a question. Y you at the Alaska Trust Company have had lots of people who've come up, thousands of trusts with you. Uh, what are the primary reasons they're coming to Alaska? Well, Jonathan, you will see that uh, a number of clients come to Alaska for basic estate planning, uh, such as perpetual trust, dynasty trust for descendants. You'll see even more clients come to Alaska for more sophisticated estate planning, uh, such as these kind of self-settled trust or hybrid self-settled trust that you've discussed today. Uh, some folks, of course, come to Alaska purely for asset protection trusts. Uh, others will come to Alaska to take advantage of the optional community property trusts. And other clients uh, come to Alaska for the low premium tax on large life insurance policies. Okay, well, great. Alan, let's go. I know we have fleeting. Alan, how much time do we have left? I would say about. I would say about 15 minutes. Okay, great. Uh, I, I have only 11 hours of, of additional material, Excellent. so I'm sure we can. <laughs> sure we can but let's go. Let's turn to one of my very favorite topics, which is powers of appointment. We just talked about how important they are, but let's go to powers of appointment. I want to cover some highlights of those. If we go to our first page that we have here, Alan. Uh, a power of appointment, by the way, it's interesting, it is not an interest in property. It is the ability to control the disposition of property. But there's some independent tax things that happen because a power of appointment is not actually an interest in property. Uh, interesting thing uh, is a power of appointment is the ability to specify where property will be transferred and that property is not owned by that person and, and that's called the power of appointment I call it a power of disposition not coupled necessarily with any ownership in that property so it, it, it's a different thing uh, 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 if you have that power held by a fiduciary uh, that is today called a decanting power. Uh, it is no question that when a trustee has a power to invade a trust, that's nothing really from a property perspective than a power of appointment. And in fact, the drafter of the restatement third of property donative transfers was going to say that a power of invasion by a fiduciary is not a power of appointment. I had a conniption over that screamed and yelled, bitched and moaned, showed all the contrary law. Why? Because when I drafted my the first decanting statute in the United States, which was in New York in 1992, I had the legislature expressly declare, and the legislative history which I wrote made it clear that a power of invasion by a fiduciary is nothing but a power of appointment, although it has to be exercised in a fiduciary manner. And from that change in 1992, we now have about 25 states that have decanting powers which specify clearly that a trustee who is, has a power to invade can invade not only by giving the property directly to the beneficiaries of the property, but also can put it in trust for them. And the analogy I drew is that if you have an individually held, a non-fiduciary power of appointment, you can exercise it in further trust. You don't have to exercise it outright unless the instrument so specified. So, Alan, let's go to our next slide, if we could. Uh, here's the decanting. Uh, there's actually a 1940s case I wasn't even aware of when I first started drafting decanting, which I began putting in my own trust in the 1970s. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is a power of appointment. Case law supports the conclusion that the trustee can do it. We now have about 25 states where it's there. It's even possible that it exists under common law. The Phipps case so holds. There's a case in New Jersey which indicates that, and there's a recent case called Morrison, Massachusetts, which indicates that. So if you are in a state which doesn't have a decanting power, you might be able to do it under a state uh, under your common law. Although both New York and Alaska have special rules which permit their state's decanting laws to be used merely essentially by appointing a co-trustee in those jurisdictions. So if you're in Oklahoma and you don't have a decanting statute, and you've got an Oklahoma trust and you really want to decant it, you want to pay it over to a new trust for whatever reason, and there can be tax consequences to that, 
and you don't have that, rather than relying on the Oklahoma common law, and there's no developed law on decanning under Oklahoma law, you could go to Alaska and appoint a co-trustee or go to New York and appoint a co-trustee, and then you could use the Alaska or New York uh, decanting statute. Uh, by the way, the, the variation in the decanting laws of the various states is quite different. Florida has a very narrow area where you could decan. Alaska and uh, New York now have very broad rules. Uh, every state is a little bit different, and sometimes I actually engage in two or three decannings. Uh, I might start with a New York trust decanning, but then send it, to, say, to South Dakota and do something, and maybe then send it to Delaware, and then maybe back to Alaska to try to get the best of all those states. Let's now go, if we could, Alan, to our next slide. Uh, the, the importance is there. You get tremendous flexibility. Nobody can foresee the future. But by giving someone a power of appointment, the trustee a decanning power, the beneficiary a power either exercisable during lifetime or at death, you can change the disposition. That means, for example, if my father gave me a power of appointment, even if it's only among my descendants to whom I can exercise it when I die, I, for example, could have more go to one of my children who has greater financial needs or I could go to a child who I feel is more deserving. Maybe that's a good thing, it's maybe it's a bad thing. Um, the King Lear effect. The next best thing to owning a lot of money is controlling a lot of money. And a power of appointment provides that benefit to the person who holds that power called the donee. So even if, for example, my father put it in trust for me for life, and then when I die it goes to my kids, if my kids know that I can deflect it elsewhere, maybe give it to charity, or maybe favor one child over another, I'm going to get a lot more attention because we all know what the golden rule is. And the golden rule is she who controls the gold rules. And as long as your client has a power of appointment, which is the great lawyer Ed Beckwith once pointed, uh, 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 pointed out, a power of appointment can also be a power of disappointment. So your children now know that even though it's in trust and you don't own it, you can control it. It requires that they give you kind of a great respect. Also, there are ways in which you can ensure that the donee won't exercise it in an inappropriate manner. For example, I get mad at one of my children for a very silly or selfish reason, and I'm going to cut that child out by exercising the power in favor of the other children or in favor of charity. Well, what you can do is to say, I give my child this power of appointment, but it can only be exercised with the prior written consent of the independent trustee. I'm now going to have to go to the trustee and try to convince the trustee that I ought to you know, disinherit a particular descendant of mine, or my family isn't deserving. Even though I've lived off this inheritance, they shouldn't uh, because they should you know, earn their own way in life. It was different for me. Well, once I talk it through with the trustee, first of all, I may not be able to convince the trustee that I should exercise in that manner. Maybe the trustee will say, I'm only going to let you do it in part. Or maybe the trustee will just say, you haven't convinced me to allow you to do it at all. This kind of requires adult supervision, so to speak. And almost all of my clients at the end of the day agree to that. How broad do you want to make the power of appointment? Well, you can limit it to a class, like of descendants. But again, you could even make it broader by, again, requiring the consent of an independent trustee. Sometimes clients say it's only among my descendants. However, if I don't have any descendants, then it's a broader power, for example, and it could include charity. Remember I mentioned a little earlier that one of the things my clients love, which I said was that the married descendant could only receive a benefit if she or he had entered into a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement which the independent trustees had determined was adequate to protect the financial interests of them. There's something else I do. And that's to arm each descendant with a power of appointment, which they can exercise with the consent of the independent trustee to continue the trust for their spouse, but only if they've entered into a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement which the trustees, the independent trustees, have determined is adequate to protect the financial interests of that particular descendant. 
So I'm married to Betsy, and Betsy says, gee, Jonathan, I want a post-nup agreement. And I say, Betsy, forget it. We've been married for 44 years. I'm not going to do it. She says, well, you know, that trust my dad just created for me, which you and I are going to be living on, well, I can continue that for your benefit, Jonathan, only if we sign a post-nup. What am I going to do? I'm going to sign the post-nup. Why? Because I'm a selfish SOB. The one thing you can count on is people's greed. And so this means that the spouse who's married to your client's descendant, he sees that carrot. He can be the successor beneficiary of this trust for the rest of his life, or maybe until he remarries or cohabits, but only if he's entered into a prenup or a postnup. And again, clients love it. And the descendant's not doing anything wrong, asking for anything. She's trying to help her husband or help her fiancé. And I've never had one of the fiancés or, or the, the husband or wife who's married to the descendant turn it down because I can count on their selfishness. Alan Liss, is there anything more here we have? I think you've done a great job pulling together a lot of important concepts, John. Let, let, let me ask Brandon a question. Brandon, uh, do you guys at the Alaska Trust Company ever get involved in decannings or involved with the uh, powers of appointment? Absolutely, Jonathan. We've had probably uh, 300 trusts that have migrated to Alaska to take advantage of our flexible decanting statutes. Well, that's it's really that's, quite common. That, that's really important. Um, but, uh, Alan, do you have any remarks for us? No, I mean, I think you covered things very well. I would mention for those of you in Florida that we do have a Florida statute that does protect the beneficiary of an IRA if they reside in Florida. But you have, if you have a Floridian client who's leaving an IRA to somebody outside of Florida, then the trust strategy is going to be very important. Also, Florida statutes do allow unlimited protection for annuity and life insurance contracts if they're owned by the individual owner for the annuity or the insured person for the life insurance. Yeah, yeah, Florida, Florida, Florida is, is perhaps the uh, best state in the country to be a debtor. Uh, Florida has, I'll call it a mini self-settled trust protection rule. If Alan creates a Q-tip trust for his wife, and when she dies, that property goes back in trust for Alan. Florida says it's immunized from claims of Alan's creditors. That's important, but it's just limited to that situation. Does that really work? Again, we don't know. Again, uh, you know, my view right now after this very, very dastardly uh, Huber case one year ago is to not allow distributions to the settlor at any time by the trustee but allow them only by someone holding a special power of appointment. And you can have, if that person dies or becomes incompetent, you can name someone else. For example, you know, you might list six of your cousins or children of your cousins, and it's probably going to last for your lifetime. That's a really, really good planning technique that I hadn't heard about. Very nice. Well, I just kind of... I just kind of developed it, but uh, uh, you know, again, bad facts make bad law. When you when you read the Hubert decision, you just it's very very hard to understand why they developed it that way. And uh, almost all the trustees were outside of Alaska. The assets were outside of Alaska. Uh, the trust was created uh, within some months of the uh, of of the uh, person going bankrupt. Um, and again, what's funny is that the court didn't have to work as hard as it did because under Alaska law, if you're making a fraudulent transfer when you transfer the assets to the trust and the court made an explicit finding of fact that it was a fraudulent transfer, Alaska law didn't provide any protection anyway. So, you know, the, the court got, you know, four independent reasons why it was going to say that these assets are subject to the claims of creditors. Why the judge... Uh, fought so hard, I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it means that whether you're in Alaska, Nevada, uh, no matter, where, you know, uh, Wyoming, Delaware, no matter where you are, uh, you may uh, wind up not getting the protection you wanted uh, when you have cases like that. That's why I'm suggesting don't do self-settled trust. Do trust for somebody else, but allow somebody to hold a power of appointment to give it back to you. Now, there's one little warning here. 
well, I'll do this trust for my wife and my kids, and I'll allow my wife and kids to appoint it to me. The Internal Revenue Service takes the position that you, if you're a beneficiary of a trust, and you hold a presently exercisable special power, and you exercise it in favor of someone else, you're making a gift. And they take the position you're making a gift even if you are only a purely discretionary beneficiary. I think the IRS may be wrong, but even if the IRS is right, I think that any gift would be de minimis, tiny, 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 because it presumably would be what could you sell that for, what could you sell your interest for. And where it's purely discretionary, I'd say it's worth no more than the proverbial peppercorn. But the IRS has refused to say by what method would you value the gift that's made by the exercise of the, of the power of appointment by a beneficiary who's only a discretionary recipient of distributions from the trust. Wow, that's a really good point. I had not been aware of that issue. Alan, do we have any questions? Um, you know, we've had some questions come in, but you have, oh, here's one from Steve Gorin. How would you recommend drafting or exercising powers of appointment to trigger the Delaware tax trap or otherwise get a basis step up at death? Well, Steve, uh, who, who's an exceptionally gifted lawyer, always asks great questions. Uh, the Delaware tax trap is something that uh, uh, Jeff Pinnell and I, I, I guess, really spearheaded back in 1988 when the new version of generation skipping came down. And people realized that in some cases you'd be better off having the property subject to a state tax when the beneficiary died rather than generation skipping tax for a variety of reasons. And But you wouldn't know. So what do you do? How do you do it? Well, people were saying, well, have the trustee invade the trust and give it to the beneficiary so it's in her estate, or grant her a general power of appointment. Well, this put a, a lot of difficulty on the trustee. The trustee have to kept it formed, work with the beneficiary, maybe not even paid for it. And then Jeff and I decided that what we would do is to have the beneficiary determine whether or not the property would be in her estate or not by controlling it through the triggering or non-triggering of a provision known as the Delaware Tax Trap. By the way, the Delaware Tax Trap was a name that was coined by Professor Kasner from Harvard, one of the greatest intellectual estate planners of his time. And in fact, Jeff now writes, uh, is the successor author to Professor Kessner's book. In any event, Section 2041A3 says, if you hold a special power of appointment with the property under which normally wouldn't be in your estate, it becomes part of your estate and is subject to inclusion in your gross estate if you exercise that special power in a manner by granting someone else a new power of appointment if that starts a new rule against perpetuities under local law. And under the law, I believe, of virtually every state, it's certainly true in New York, if I create, if I have a special power and I put it into further trust for someone else, say one of my children, and normally that trust would be subject to the normal rule against perpetuities from the time my father gave me my special power when he died in 1972. But New York law says if I give my son when I die a presently exercisable general power over the trust I've created for him, that starts a new rule against perpetuities period. And it's easy to see why. My son can take the property out. It's as though he created the trust right then and there. And that will mean I have now caused that property to be included in my estate. Uh, and indeed, under Delaware law and Arizona law, you can trigger that even by granting somebody a presently exercisable special power of appointment. Now, you've got to be aware of two things, and this gets to the heart of Steve's question. You've got to be sure that the manner by which you're exercising the special power to trigger the Delaware tax trap section 2041A3, and therefore cause inclusion of the property over which you hold the uh, special power of appointment back in your estate so you get a step up in basis, so you can you know, allocate your own uh, exemption, to, uh, uh, GST exemption to it or whatever you want to do, you've got to be sure that it will commence a new rule against perpetuities period. 
In some states, that may not happen because they've completely repealed the rule against perpetuity. So if you want to make sure you've got it, one of the things you might do is at the time you're creating the trust under which someone's going to be given the special power, make sure that governing law would start a new rule against perpetuities period or move the trust, if it's pre-existing and you're not sure, to another state. How can you get it to another state? Hmm, let me think. What about decanting? Suppose I'm in the state of Oz, and no matter how hard we try, we can't trigger the Delaware tax trap, but we really want it. Well, what I'll do is I will decant that trust to another state, uh, and, and, and where I can, uh, maybe it's Arizona, maybe it's Delaware, maybe it's Alaska, Steve, maybe it's Missouri, where I know I can trigger the trap because I'll exercise it and that will begin a new rule against perpetuities under the law of that particular state. So that was a great question. Any others, Alan? And I realize we're just about out of time. There was one question, which was, do you think that if an annuity is owned under an IRA, and payable to a beneficiary in a state that protects annuities but not IRAs, is there any chance that that would be creditor protected? Well, Alan, that is, uh, that is a great question. I don't know the answer. I guess it depends on whether you view it as an annuity or whether you view it as an inherited IRA. And I'm not sure that the, under the Clark case that you can say, ah, we're going to forget that it's an inherited IRA. We're going to say, you know, it's an annuity. I would guess that that would be risky. As I said earlier and as Alan reinforced, if you want creditor protection, and I don't care if it's an inherited IRA or it's your mother's china set, put it in trust. It's the most important thing you can do for your clients. Because again, subject to these super vapid powers that the federal government has given itself in some cases, you can completely, uh, completely protect assets that, in a trust that someone else has created for your benefit. And again, under Alaska law, uh, Mitch Gans and Brandon and the others uh, uh, up there who worked on this with me, we believe it's now the Alaska statute is drafted if you have a discretionary trust, so even the federal government can't get its hands on the beneficiary's interest in the trust or the trust assets. Well, Jonathan Alan, and Brandon, I cannot thank you enough for joining us. I know our participants really enjoyed it, and I just hope you'll come back sometime anytime you want to talk about anything you want. Well, Alan, that's very kind of you. We appreciate the opportunity. All right, well, everybody, have you, a great Alan. afternoon, and may the rest of your time be completely billable. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>